This interview is the second half of an episode of my new podcast, The Explanation. So if you want to listen to the full episode, be sure to subscribe by clicking the link in the description or on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for joining us, Ross. Um, unfortunately, Sylvia was not able to make this interview because of a scheduling conflict, but she'll be back for next week's interview, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Very happy to be on to talk Cuomo and left politics and everything else. Yeah, so like you said, in the first half of the episode, we talked about the Cuomo administration. And one of the things that Sylvia brought up was how Cuomo has always been, even when he was working for his father, viewed as the enforcer, and he's always had a bit of a reputation as a bully. And I want to know what you think is behind that as someone who's looked really deeply into him. And if you were going to try to get inside of his head, do you think that that is just who he is, or is that a political strategy? And if it is the latter, then what's that strategy hoping to achieve? I think it's a mixture of both. Um, you know, I, I don't believe there's a secret progressive, you know, hiding in Andrew Cuomo that is kept at bay because he must pursue a certain type of strategy. I, I do think his politics and ideology are fundamentally not of the left, but he will do left things and achieve left policy outcomes if he's forced into doing that. And, and you, you see this pattern throughout his tenure as governor where popular pressure must be built, deals must be cut, elections must be won, and finally Cuomo gives ground. Um, it's rarely Cuomo out in front attempting to achieve a progressive aim, the, the exception really being uh, same-sex marriage a decade ago. It's almost always there must be a fight um, there must be a, a give and take. He must try to sabotage the left and then eventually the goal can be reached. And maybe he even co-ops the goal for his own ends. You know, the, the minimum wage fight was a good example of this where Cuomo mocked and dismissed the idea of raising the minimum wage later did allow a gradual rise to 15 an hour in parts of the state, including New York City. Um, but the, but the uh, journey to that was unnecessarily uh, fraught and complicated. But your, your question was about Cuomo, you know, working for his father and his strategy. And yes, he was very much known as the enforcer for his father, Mario Cuomo, who was governor for 12 years. You know, he was the man on the phones, har haranguing lawmakers. He was really the person at his father's side, um, you know, being known as someone who is very difficult to deal with and very intimidating and very scary, um, you know, for, for lawmakers of that era. It, it was not a pleasant experience dealing with a young Andrew Cuomo. And fundamentally, if you look at his trajectory, you know, he is someone who believes his father erred in appearing too liberal or having, in, in some cases, too liberal sensibilities. And what I'll just say as a caveat there is Mario Cuomo actually was not a very liberal governor. But unlike Andrew, he enjoyed being seen as a liberal beacon, especially in the Reagan era. So he was a great orator. He was good in his own way uh, um, at inspiring hope uh, among the left. But in terms of the actual policy achievements, uh, Mario Cuomo did very little for the left. And in fact, quietly sabotaged the left in his own way, like Andrew Cuomo would later do. So, you know, we, we start from that, that bedrock and that reality. But, you know, a Andrew Cuomo rightly saw his father somewhat feckless. You know, Mario Cuomo spent 12 years as governor and had no, few, no or few tangible achievements. And his legacy may have been the construction of a lot of state prisons, which is a, a quite... Uh, lousy uh, and, and, and disturbing legacy. And in terms of actual legislation and, and big progressive achievements, they're basically non-existent. Andrew, you know, in his defense, has more progressive achievements under his belt than his father did. But he's also someone who has gone even further 
to thwart and alienate the left, you know, keeping Republicans in power in the state Senate for almost his entire tenure, which really just guaranteed all the recent progressive victories the left has won would come as late as possible. Had Andrew Cuomo been a conventional Democratic governor, you would have seen progressive achievements in 2013, 2014, 2015. Instead, we had to wait until 2019 and 2020 and now 2021. Um, and, and that was really because of Andrew Cuomo. And, you know, his strategy has always been triangulation. His father was a triangulator too, but was more of a kinder, gentler triangulator. Andrew is someone who is, is quite the cutthroat triangulator. And you saw this in, in the state legislature with his support, his, his very quiet support, um, but very real support of the Republicans. And you see this in his approach to a lot of issues where he will often be on both sides of an issue. He will state support for an issue and then try to sabotage it behind the scenes. In 2019, he almost did this successfully with the push to give uh, driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants. It, the, the state Senate Democrats were very committed to doing this. Cuomo publicly said he supported the idea and behind the scenes, he was working aggressively against it and telling the Democrats, if you do this, you will cost yourselves the majority um, and you will face a backlash from the voters. This turned out to not be the case. The Senate Democrats reached the supermajority in 2020 um, and Cuomo actually lost that fight. And so it is an example of there were enough Democrats to overcome Cuomo. Um, but even with this new liberal majority, even with Cuomo tacking left in his in his third term, he was still attempting to sabotage the left at a very important policy goal. So that seems like an odd strategy because to publicly support something and then privately push back against it. It almost seems like you would get all of the backlash of supporting that, but then risk it not actually happening, and then also get the backlash from people, um, people who are in favor of that. So, like, you would get the backlash from people who are opposed to that policy, conservatives and such, who think that you are trying to push that policy through. But then, if you kill it, you get the backlash from progressives and liberals who wanted to see that policy get put in place. So, um. I don't know, what do you think is the thinking there? Because that, just, that seems very counterintuitive. You know, it, it's a strategy you pursue if you don't want things to happen. I, I think that that is what can be the confounding thing for those who are vaguely familiar with Andrew Cuomo, but are not that steeped in the weirdness of New York politics. It's that Cuomo often will not want progressive policy goals to come to fruition. And he also doesn't want to be blamed for that, for them not coming to fruition, blamed by regular voters, not progressive activists and elected officials and insiders who know Cuomo's game and call him out. He very cunningly knows that the average person does not pay attention to this stuff. So the average person may see Cuomo on the news coming out in support of a policy and go, wow, Andrew Cuomo supports that. Then the policy is later defeated or dies and they go, well, at least Andrew Cuomo tried. I guess it just didn't happen. Um, and you saw this happen again and again throughout his time in office where he would be trying to really sabotage a pol progressive policy goal behind the scenes publicly either express full support or at least mild support or at least seem indifferent. Whereas privately he was anything but indifferent. And it's, it's the kind of strategy you pursue if you don't want to see something happen and you want to trick the average Democrat to thinking you are still a progressive. And it actually works. The playbook in Cuomo's defense has been moderately successful in his 12 years as governor, even with the backlash he's facing now, um, even with his change in fortunes, he's been governor this long and he's been very good at frustrating, thwarting, confusing his enemies who are broadly speaking, anyone who wants to see good progressive policy happen in the state. 
Well, I'm going to ask about that because we talked in the first half about the rally around the flag effect effect that Cuomo enjoyed during the first half of last year, and then the kind of drop off a cliff that his approval had as all of these scandals get, came to light. But over time, as memories memory of those scandals is kind of fading further, his popularity has been slowly starting to rise again. And I think it's obvious that he's trying to ride it out and hope that people will forget about these things. Um, I think Donald Trump probably provided a great lesson that that's a possibility, that you can just let people forget about a scandal in a few months. As someone who's intimately familiar with New York politics and who you're in New York looking at uh, how people are responding, how realistic do you think it is that people by election time will, or by primary time, will have forgotten about these scandals? Well, it's realistic if there's no new developments. Right now, we are waiting on the outcome of several different investigations. It's important to remember that. Right now, Cuomo exists in limbo. He is winning in the sense that as time passes, people forget, they care less. That's, that's natural, right? And the primary wouldn't be till June of next year. So he's got a full year to go. Now, he is contending with a federal investigation into his cover-up of, of nursing home deaths from COVID. He is contending with a state attorney general's investigation into the many sexual harassment claims against him. So these investigations will have to reach their conclusion at some point and produce findings. Will there be an indictment on the federal level? Maybe not. Good for Cuomo if there isn't one. What will the attorney general's report say? Will it substantiate the allegations? Will it create a new negative news cycle? The state assembly has been in a long running, in a somewhat ineffective impeachment inquiry that at this point appears designed to help Cuomo. Um, but a lot of, of rank and file assembly members are getting frustrated with their leadership. And it's possible if the attorney general's report is damning enough, if there are some new revelations that the assembly can move to impeach and will that happen? Odds are against it. I, I would not bet on it, but it's not, it, it's, it's, there's a, a, a non-zero possibility of it happening. It could happen. If there's an impeachment, Cuomo actually faces a lot of challenges in the Senate where the trial would happen. This is not like the impeachments of Donald Trump, where they were doomed from the beginning because the Republican-controlled Senate was never, ever, ever going to convict Donald Trump of anything. You're never going to reach the threshold of votes needed for it. It was always a, a liberal fantasy that you'd remove Trump from office. Removing Cuomo from office is not a liberal fantasy. Um, it would be very hard, but you could see a coalition of votes among progressive Democrats and Republicans who hate Cuomo, just, just to give you an example. So that's always important to keep in mind. Can Cuomo survive? Yes. Does he plan to run for a fourth term? Yes, he wants to. Will he resign? Not likely. Now, this primary, assuming there's a primary next year and he gets challenged again, could be Cuomo's most difficult. I did a column very recently about how Tish James, the attorney general, would kind of be the ideal primary challenger of Cuomo because she has some left credentials. She is a statewide elected official and, and she also has deep ties in Brooklyn's black community. And to beat Andrew Cuomo, you must do well with Black and Latino voters in New York City. Andrew Cuomo has always won outspending his opponents by tons of money and running up the score in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. If a candidate can cut into those margins and do well with anti-Cuomo voters north of the city, that candidate can win. And so that's why I do think ideally a Black challenger against Cuomo um, would run. And I do think Tish James herself, given her pedigree now as attorney general, given her ability now to distance herself from Cuomo, she could emerge as that challenger. Will, will she run to be determined? We don't know. Um, but I do think she looms over him and could make his life very difficult, particularly because she has ties to many of the same labor unions that he does. 
she could pick off his support behind the scenes if indeed that's the decision she makes down the road. Yeah, Sylvia and I did talk about how it seems uh, she's being very running a very effective public relations campaigns with all of her um, investigations, which you don't see all attorney generals doing. Can you explain what you mean when you say that the impeachment inquiry almost seems designed to help Cuomo? Yeah, so it's moving along incredibly slowly and it's really producing no new updates. And it's been ongoing for months now. The leadership of the state assembly is fairly deferential to Cuomo. You have an interesting dynamic in the state legislature now where where the state Senate, which once was controlled by Republicans, has now become very progressive as a lot of new young lawmakers who despise Cuomo have power. In the assembly, you've seen a lot less turnover. The assembly is a much bigger body. Just to give you an idea, there are 63 state senators. There are 150 assembly members. The assembly, of course, for non-New York viewers is the equivalent of the House of Representatives. It's the state house of the lower chamber. So it's bigger. A lot of members there have been there a very long time. There are no term limits. So you have a state assembly members who were there when Mario Cuomo was governor in the 80s. You have state assembly members who have been around a very long time. And with few exceptions, the longer they've been around, the more deferential they are to Cuomo. The more moderate they tend to be, the more less risk-taking they tend to be. Whereas the younger members are really willing to stir the pot. The issue in the assembly is the the DSA contingent is still very small. And then the non-DSA progressive contingent still isn't big enough to move the ball forward. So you have this kind of overarching democratic majority that is cautious and would probably rather not impeach Cuomo. The question will become if if Tish James's report is particularly damning, if there are new revelations, if other allegations are substantiated, whether it was Cuomo forcing his staff to work on his book, which he got a $5 million advance for, um, you know, whether there's more COVID nursing home revelations that could force the assembly's hand. There may be pressure built up to push it forward. But as of now, the longer it grind, grinds on, the longer it fades from public view. I'm talking about the assembly inquiry, the better it is for Andrew Cuomo. There's no doubt a long drawn out assembly inquiry that goes nowhere is wonderful for the governor. I think I see some parallels there to the recall election of Gavin Newsom, uh, because California, like New York, is also a very progressive state, and uh, Newsom, like Cuomo, is a um, somewhat establishment Democrat. And there are a lot of progressives in California who would also like to see Newsom go, but I think the majority of the Democratic of the Democratic Party there would tell you that the recall a, a recall is not the way they would want to see uh, Newsom go. How much? credit do you think that Cuomo deserves for his handling of the pandemic? Obviously, he's gotten a lot that really brought him to fame. Um, but when uh, when we were looking back at it in the first half, uh, talking about the poster that he published, the big mountain that he had made for his press conferences, um, it seems very, um, very much for the camera. And I'm wondering if you think that he deserves the credit that he got. Did he make a substantive difference compared to, for instance, uh, Phil Murphy, who's also a Democratic governor in neighboring New Jersey, or was it mostly optics? It was mostly optics. I'll I'll say just quickly on the Newsom-Cuomo comparison, I think the big difference between Newsom and Cuomo is Newsom is a conventional center-left Democrat who broadly believes in empowering Democrats and for all his flaws does not triangulate in the same way partly because california politics probably don't allow him to but you know he he he's been i think more you know of a governor who's not delivered on some promised progressive aims but he is not probably thwarted the left in the same way that cuomo has cuomo's also been in power much longer 
Um, but you know, Cuomo is very unique in the sense that there's no other Democratic governor in America who would actively support and encourage Republican control of the state legislature. Very, very hard to imagine happening anywhere else. Hard to imagine the reverse happening where a Republican governor wants Democratic control of the state legislature. So just, just, just putting that aside as a caveat, in terms of the pandemic response, a lot of it was optics. New York had the second highest death toll in America, second to California. California is twice as large a state. So the death rate in New York was far higher than in California. And if you go by death rate, New York is second in America to New Jersey. So just on raw numbers, New York failed miserably to contain COVID when you look at other states that had to grapple with outbreaks early in the pandemic, like Washington State and California. California struggled later on, but did a very good job at containment early on that, that saved lives, that definitely uh, definitely kept a worse outbreak from happening. Even to this day, very, very few people died of COVID in San Francisco. New York City had over 30,000 COVID deaths. So a look at the raw numbers will tell you New York didn't really succeed. Right, but the, the death rate in New York is far, far higher. So I think, I, I remember, I haven't looked at San Francisco's COVID numbers in a while, but I think it was, I'm not sure if a thousand people died of COVID in San Francisco. I'm not, I have to double check. Uh, might have been less. New York had over 30. You know, New York is not 30 times the size of uh, San Francisco. Um, so the death rate in New York City was a lot, a lot higher. Um, you, you had, you had, there was a time in the pandemic where there were individual nursing homes that had higher death tolls than the city of San Francisco. Um, so you look at raw numbers and, you know, that, that tells one story. New York was very slow to shut down. Cuomo was denying that COVID was a threat well into March of 2020. And that's part of the theme of my book, uh, when people go and read it and they're sometimes surprised to learn that, Cuomo was comparing COVID to the flu well into March of 2020. Even when it was very clear COVID was spreading and killing people, he was saying it wasn't a big deal. So like Donald Trump, he downplayed the threat. He didn't take it seriously. He stopped New York City from doing its own shelter in place order because Bill de Blasio suggested it and he hates Bill de Blasio. And then he would do it about five days later. But by then, you know, more people had died. Um, so very slow response, mismanagement of nursing homes, which isn't just a New York story. Other states struggled with nursing homes. New York struggled as well. Um, miscounting deaths in nursing homes, purposefully undercounting them. The mismanagement of the hospital system, very little coordination be between public and private hospitals the attempts to defund public hospitals during the pandemic, which was a, a frightening fight that the left had to undertake and was largely successful in staving off the worst of the Medicaid cuts to public hospitals. And, you know, the, the overall chaos of the response led to more deaths. So objectively little was done well. And when New York shut down, the death toll went down, <clears throat> the cases declined and Cuomo got credit for that and that's fine. The problem is the shutdown happened after most of the death had occurred. So by the time we were shut down, we were in New York pause. You had, you know, tens of thousands of people who'd been sickened or died. So it was too little, too late. Then Cuomo tried to implement austerity measures throughout 2020 rather than raise taxes on the wealthy or borrow money. He enacted cuts um, to the public college and university systems to local governments in the state. You know, 2020 really was a, a, a time of deep economic uncertainty in New York where it didn't have to be this way. Phil Murphy did push in a tax hike on the rich in 2020. New York got very lucky that Democrats won control of the U.S. Senate and a federal bailout came, but there was a lot of suffering fiscally and of course with the virus before then um, and and any honest assessment of 
New York's pandemic response will show that on almost any metric, it was not successful. Now, Cuomo was not alone in not succeeding, and I don't blame all the death in Cuomo. I never do. I say it in my book, and I tell people, I don't blame Cuomo for all the death. I really don't. It was a very, very difficult situation. My issue is he doesn't deserve credit for anything. No, almost nothing was done well. Uh, in New York City, in New York State, we suffered tremendously. And the proof is in the numbers. Yeah, I feel like I feel like this will probably be remembered in New York, not dissimilarly to how 9-11 is remembered as a similarly defining and traumatic event for the city. Um, before we get finished, I want to ask you two more things. I want to ask you first, if not for COVID, what position would Cuomo be in now? If we had had the same scandals, but he had not had that, um, well, I guess he wouldn't have had the nursing home scandal, but if the sexual harassment scandals, for instance, had come out and everything before Cuomo, before COVID had happened, but COVID had not, what position would Cuomo be in now? And then after that, uh, can you tell us about your book? Sure. Cuomo would definitely be in a weaker position. Cuomo still retains a lot of support from rank and file Democrats. And a decent amount of that is tied to the belief that he responded well to the pandemic and he comforted the populace during this terrible time. In part, you know, that was a natural response in the time of crisis. In part, it was a media creation. Cable TV, prestige media propped up Cuomo during the crisis. And that image has lingered, even as his numbers have taken a hit. You had national magazines putting him on the cover. You had cable TV like CNN celebrating him every day, letting his brother interview him, which was travesty. Even outlets like the New York Times were not always reporting skeptically in Cuomo. So you had this very profound and powerful media bubble that really created this image of Cuomo the COVID conqueror that has not entirely faded. And there, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that the popularity he enjoyed of last year is still enough to keep his numbers from cratering completely. His overall approval rating is a lot lower than it once was, and even his support among Democrats is lower. Uh, but the fact that he can hang on through all of this is, is a testament to how popular he once was. And in terms of my book, it's called um, The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus and the Fall of New York, which is a purposeful echo of Machiavelli's The Prince and also Robert Caro's The Power Broker, um, which was uh, The Power Broker, Robert Moses and the Fall of New York. Um, and it's out on June 22nd. You can still pre-order to get that 15% discount. So I urge you to do that. And it's the first book of its kind. It is a, a thorough accounting of Andrew Cuomo's failures during COVID. And it's also a political history of Andrew Cuomo. So for those who are interested in what the heck is going on in New York, who really want to know the true story of COVID in New York, I strongly suggest you buy the book and read it. I think you'll find it very interesting. And if, you're, and if you like politics, and you kind of want to know the history of what's going on. I also dive into Andrew Cuomo's history in the state, and I talk about his father as well. So you do get that uh, sense of background that, that I think will be useful to readers. And I really see my book as a rejoinder to the pandemic memoir Cuomo put out last year and made $5 million from. And if you are listening to this on the day it comes out, it's two weeks from today that the book will come out. Mm hmm. Yeah, June June twenty second, and we're we'll, we'll actually gonna have a launch party. Um, I will share details on my Twitter at Ross Barkin about that. Um, it will be in person. It will not be a Zoom party, so that that will I think be exciting to people. It, it's gonna be one of the first kind of COVID era uh, and end of COVID, you know, in person book events. So yeah, so I think it'll be a lot of fun for people to be able to gather outdoors and uh, you know sort of discuss these issues and, and reflect on what happened. Um, and, you know, like, like, like I was saying, you know, I really see this book as a rejoinder to the pandemic memoir that Cuomo put out, 
which to me and to many others was a work of propaganda. I unfortunately had to read the Cuomo pandemic memoir to do research for my book. And it's amazing how many uh, mistruths, elisions, uh, falsehoods are in that book. And so I really see this, see this book, my book as a valuable corrective. Um, I hope it's seen that way. Uh, response so far has been pretty positive. You know, we're expecting a lot more reviews in the coming weeks. And I encourage you to buy it. Or Books, that's OR Books, is putting it out. So if you go to orbooks.com, you can find it. You can Google the prints, Ross Bark and Andrew Cuomo. It should pop up pretty quickly. Like I said, the, the pre-order is good because you help out authors like myself who really depend on pre-orders to build momentum for the book. And you get 15% off. So it, it's a win-win situation. So I encourage you to pre-order. The books are shipping now. People have received their pre-orders. So you can uh, get it pretty quickly if you order. And, you know, it, it's definitely, it, it's a book that I hope will be of value to people this year and in coming years as well. Since, you know, there will be more pandemic remembrances and, and analyses I really see this one as the first one, and that focuses entirely on Cuomo and New York State's response. And, and I can say there's no other book like it. So, you know, if you get it, you, you'll, you'll have something that is not like anything else that's currently on the market. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today, Ross. Thank you for having me. Had a, had a lot of fun talking Cuomo. Yeah, it was a great conversation. And we'll talk to you later.